Hello and welcome back to the What The Folk Sunderland Review Podcast. A battling second half display ensured that Sunderland picked up a very well-deserved draw at home to High Flying Luton Town as we drew 1-1 at the Stadium of Light thanks to a late Ama Diallo penalty. As always, we're going to be reviewing the performance. Someone that has joined us after about two months to possibly six months away is uh, Bradley Sharp. Brad, how are you doing, mate? You okay? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Um... Like you just said, it's been a while since I've been on. Um, made an appear, made, made a reappearance. Now that the the result picked up a little bit, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't really expecting much from today, if I'm honest. And I think just that how, how we battled towards the end was was quite refreshing. It, it, it was a bit like the Watford game away from home, where we just made some changes and said, "Right, just go for it." And yeah, I, I was quite impressed, really, on the whole. Yeah, same. I, I actually spent a lot of time clapping them off. I was like Mr. Clappy McClapperson today because I was quite proud of the way they battled on the pitch. But um, Dave, obviously you weren't at the game today, but from from the performance and a few hours later, how how are you feeling about a one-one draw to home with Luton Town? Yeah, it's. Um, I think it just reiterates what we've been saying for quite a while, doesn't it? How uh, how we've got very good personalities and. And players with the right attitude in the team and in the squad and with the right staff and yeah, it's it's nice. We we seem to come together. We're not in the uh, we're not in the greatest form over the grand scheme of things, but yeah, we're we're hanging on in there. And I'm just hoping we finish tenth, just so I can be right for once. For once, um, <laughs> Brad, I come to you first, obviously, because it's been a while since we've been on. I think. We've all said in the intro there, it was a, a real battle and performance. I was actually really proud of them today. Um, whereas maybe I was a little bit frustrated by the attitude a few weeks ago in the Stoke game. Um, the Norwich game last week obviously was a much more positive podcast. And today, as much as kind of like, you know, I can't say we were outstanding. I think today was a, a little bit about kind of the guts and the determination, which I think it was last week in the Norwich game. Or just obviously you feel a bit brighter because you've gone away from home and won against a really good team. But Luton might not be as a fashionable a name as Norwich City are, but they're above them in the table for a reason. Is that um, how good of a point is that today for you, Brad? I think it's a really good point when you think when you think about. It. I've seen a lot after a day where they're saying it's only one win in seven or whatever. Yeah, we want to put a positive spin on it. With our last three games has been Luton, Sheffield United, and Norwich, and we picked up four points. That's not that's not a bad return when you look at the teams that they are really. Um, I think the lads, obviously, first half. I don't think we can really talk about anything in the first half because that was god boring. There was nothing really happened except for we hit the post. It's just really, it is a big thing, but not a lot really happened. Um, I think what what it came down to was, I think they played with no fear. It was sort of like, look, we're one 0 down. Let's just see what we can do. And credit to them, I think as soon as we went to goal down. It was just like the shackles would come off and let's just see what we can do. And credit to Mowbray's changes today. Um, I think they really, they really did have a big impact on the game, every single one of them. Um, Luton are a good side and I think I think they've got the joint best or the best away record in the country or at least in this league. Um, so they're no mugs away from home. They're a team of big lads. Um, Mowbray alluded to it in the post-match saying he was walking up the tunnel it was like Giants versus just lads um, so I mean they had some big lads in their team especially the the, the big centre forward uh, Adebayo or whatever he's, I think he's called um, but we handled them quite well um, yeah we're not going to we're never going to win a game for, uh, like uh, the physical battle but from how we dug in uh, it's it's it was it was really good to watch, especially the last twenty minutes. It was probably probably the most exciting I've seen it in the last five or six weeks. Going forward, it was the elephant in the room. Is <laughs> the amount of times we could have had the ball in the box to a striker if we had one there. Um, but we grounded out, got a penalty, which uh, debatable. Um, <laughs> stuck it away and. Look, there was five minutes added on at the end. There was only one team going to go on and win that if anyone was going to, and that was us. And uh, yeah, it was a good end of the game, to be honest. Yeah, and you know what? I actually, um, I feel like over the past few weeks, I've probably been a bit more 
my usual type that goes before this season, which is probably bordering more on pessimism than optim- optimism. But I think what th- what's really positive about it, you touched on L- uh, Luton's away record there. They they have got the best record in the country, I think. They're either, like you say, either there or thereabouts the top. Um, they beat like Sheffield United recently away from home, who I, th- I think we've seen on Wednesday, uh, they were a good side. Um, whether they cheated, well, well, whether it was should have been disallowed one thing they cheated that their second goal, they, they are a good side, and um, they've gone up to place bigger places, um, than Sheffield United and won as well. Uh, they've done really well. I think the only game they've lost over the past 11 was, was Burnley. We've kind of gone up against them today with. I was sent a half you can play right back because he's right footed playing at left back two young lads in the middle um, and no strikers look we'll get on to it a bit more I'm done to death with speaking about it but there's something obviously we need to bring up with that later on in the show regarding possibly Joe Geltart. Um but I felt like the, the lads really battled today and, and I think for the first time in a long time when we've come up against a far more physical side we might not have won the physical battle, but I felt like we outworked them. And I felt like that's kind of where we got our our joy today was like, well, you might be able to do this in the physical battle, but you know, we're gonna keep going and we're gonna try and like just chase it and harry it and just blood, sweat, and tears as best as we can. Because I think I spoke about it in the preview show. I said I don't think we can lose another one because that's five defeats and six, I think it would have been. Whereas you pointed something out massively there. I think it was me and Dave after the Stoke game. I can barely remember. I was barely there, if I'm completely honest with you. I was absolutely wrecked um, ever as a professional. Um, but I think I said after the Stoke game, I was like, God, we've got Norwich, Sheffield United, Luton and Burnley. If I'm honest with you, if you give me four points out of those four games and we've still got Burnley to play, I would have probably stuck it. If I'm completely honest, because... Um, Apart from Norwich, they're probably the four best sides in the uh, three of the best four sides in the league. And I think Norwich on the day are very good and we're probably on the best runner form out of the majority of these teams. But, um, but Dave, like Brad said, I think the battle was excellent today. And I honestly think in the last 20 minutes, some of our attack and play was really, really good. Um, that was because of a change in shape. That did help us. We went to that sort of what looked like a back three with Equa sort of lying deep. I think. We've all spoke about it a little bit, Dave, about changing the formation. Do you think that maybe with the situation we've got, with the fact that we don't really have a striker, and we're going to get on to Geltart in a minute, but do you think potentially that going to back three and playing a bit more like we did today and trying maybe getting Patrick Roberts and Pritchard and that a little bit more central behind maybe, a, I don't know, somebody, whoever wants to play striker this week, it was Benetti, kind of sort of Diallo sort of a bit today. Could like a back three, a bit more steady at the back, a bit more solid and a, a kind of a deep line midfielder and Eckwork maybe produce more results? Is, is that last 20 minutes maybe evidence that a change in shape might work? I think it's a free hit, isn't it? What we got, nine games left. Just, yeah, why not try these things? Um, I've seen quite a few murmurs and, and like you said, we'll get on to Gelhart eventually, but quite a few moments of should he maybe be sat on the bench and, and let our young lads experience what it's going to be like next season. Um, you know, there was a couple of statistics about, I think there's still that massive pessimism with uh, with being a Sunderland fan and, and worrying about being dragged into a dogfight. I think, uh, if I remember rightly, um, 54 points is the most someone's gone down with. We're on 52 or 53 after a day, sorry. Um, it, it's just not going to happen. Obviously, we want to finish as high as we can. It's been a very productive season. I see no reason why we shouldn't go and try things like that. Uh, you know, it, it's really nice, isn't it, to hear that Egwa has done so well today, bearing in mind that uh, a couple of weeks ago, he looked like a rabbit in the headlights. So he's only going to develop. He's only going to get on. He's obviously got the, the physical side of his game and the the energy side of his game which um, you know pressing high up the pitch which we were talking about before we came on um, it's it's a good start uh, and I, I just think yeah why not do things like that it's, football's so fluid nowadays isn't it I mean I, I even remember who was it I think it was Alex Snail maybe he's even oh no it was Lee Johnson before him playing a back four, but when we had the ball, we ended up playing a back three and moving on a 
it's all very clever and intricate nowadays. Maybe it's too clever and intricate for some people. But uh, yeah, why not? Why not give it a chance? Why not give some of the kids a chance? It's it's just a complete nut free hit. So yeah, and it's paying dividends. If we're going to have to work out how to play against teams like that, let's hope we're not going in next season without three centre forwards. Let's be honest about it. But if we are, we need to find out ways to, to actually make a difference. And yeah, something like that might not be a, a bad idea whatsoever. Funny that you mentioned there, uh, about being fluid there. And I think you're right. We, you know, we did sort of drift sometimes between a back three and a a back four last year, and, and there was times when it really did pay dividends. Um, I think we were back three for a lot of time under Alex Neal under in League One, and then towards the playoff games, we went to sort of a back four. I think at the minute, there's no one really... Uh, I thought nine was absolutely superb today. Um, for me, him and, and Trey Hume were the, the two best players in the park, uh, arguably. Were really, really good today, I thought, both of them. But I think it's quite obvious that Luke is not like a marauding left-back and I think his passing is actually a lot better than what people think. And I think when he's in like a back three, he looks a little bit more comfortable. And I think the performance of Lyndon Gooch today, when he came on for the last 20, was absolutely superb. We, we talk about changes and stuff like that. And I don't want to give away who I think was excellent because I've kind of just done it already. But Brad, I, I think there was a lot of good performances on the pitch today, both on the pitch um, as substitutes and both from the start. We'll come to one particularly negative later. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone where we're going to go with that. Um, and there's reasons behind it. But, but who are the players that stood out for you today? If you were to pick like two or three that you thought had, you know, the best players in the park or potentially player of the match? Um, pretty much the same as you. I thought Hume was good, yeah. Um, but for me, the two standouts, I mean, we've said how good we were in the last 20 minutes going forward. But again, same as the Norwich game, it was our back line that really stood stood strong um, I thought Ballard was excellent I, I'm going to probably say that was one of his best games for us just how solid he was and he was stepping out with the ball a lot more than he usually does there was times where he'd maybe get the ball in the right centre half position and then you'd look for a Stewart in the pocket in behind running the lines and it wasn't on so he'd just step in he'd step in with the ball and you create a new bit of space which was a bit different to what we've seen uh, from our, our centre half really um, but Lugo 9 for me I just thought he was excellent um, there was a point in the second half like, we, we won a free kick and it was just his quick thinking he, like Pritchard was going to take it and he just pinged it with his left to Roberts and got us on the front foot straight away and that's just like that comes with having experience of football knowing to move it quickly um, and he's passed for Clark the second half um, I think everyone will remember that. Just the way that it wasn't even looking where it was going. And look, if we'd have scored, that would have been talking about probably goal, another goal of the season. Um, but unfortunately, the ball fell to Gelhart. <laughs> um, and he put it wide. Oh, if he was playing, I mean, I know people are saying he's not an out-and-out nine. If you play him with confidence, you hit that first time. He probably hit the tie and you give the keeper something to do. But he's took a touch, took another touch and lost it. And, well, he's dragged it about 20 feet wide. Which is a shame. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the whole back line, Bart, was just steady. Uh, he, he was he, he was great. We'd just come to expect that from him. But 09 and Ballard, for me, was were just exceptional. Like, the, I, I was talking to my dad and my cousin, who I sat with today, and we were talking about 09. And I know a lot of people, it's not everyone's cup of tea. But we, everyone knows how much me and you love him, Graham. Um, and I struggle, apart from the game where he got sent off against Swansea, I, I, I struggle to think of a game he ever dips below 6.5. Like, he's just, he's always a good player, but he never goes below. When, when he stands out, it's not because he's played badly. He stands out because he's just took the next level and he, he's just been outstanding. And I think against Sheffield United, and like, he was probably our best player as well. Um, and he was an, he was a candidate for man of the match against Norwich. I know Danny Bart got it, but in my eyes, I think he was man of the match then as well. Um, I'd keep him at left back. I mean, <laughs> we haven't really got a choice because uh, Elise is out for the season and Sergan's still a bit 
It's a bit no. concerned though about Sirkin, mate. It is a bit worrying that because I mean We're talking next... about eight weeks later and he's yeah. still getting dizzy off that. That's that's quite alarming that the club don't really want to come out and talk too much about it either. Um I hope he's all right. Get well soon, Dennis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is quite concerning and, and it, it's a shame because look before the bow game, before he started getting these injuries, Sirkin was a candidate for me for our player of the season as well. But it's nice that we've got like Luke O'Neill and who only a few weeks ago people were saying just put him back in the middle of midfield. Now we're saying you can't drop him out of left back. The only way that you can change it is if he goes to a left centre half. Because he, for me, he's, him, along with any of them in the back four are the first names on the team sheet week in, week out. I, I agree with O'Neill and I know it's going to, I know some people really don't like him. I don't understand that, but football's a game of opinions and I'd be probably more annoyed if everyone liked him because then that would just be boring, wouldn't it? But for me, eight or nine is 100% one of the first names on the team sheet, wherever you want to put them. If I'm honest, I prefer him in the defence. I prefer him in a, in a back three, if I'm completely honest with you. But I think as long as he's kicking around the team somewhere, uh, for me, he's the absolute heartbeat of everything that's good from, from Sunderland because he just adds energy, effort, character, everything you want on the pitch from a Sunderland team, he adds it in whatever position. And I absolutely echo what you said before about Dan Ballard. I said today, look, teams are going to be looking at him in the summer. They've got to be. He's he's far too good for this level. But I will be, and I think there's going to be a day when we're going to sadly have to say goodbye to Dan Ballard. And I don't mean to be sad and depressive on this show, everyone, but uh, if we get less than 25 million in today's market, I'll, I'll be very disappointed. I think Dan Ballard is that good. I don't think I've seen him necessarily have a bad game outside of maybe Coventry away when Jokeres, arguably the best striker in the league, give him a bit of a going over. But I think he's superb. But I agree with you on O'Neill. I think he's the best player on the pitch. But um, there's a couple of subs I think really made a difference. I think Equa probably put in his most promising performance so far. A couple of his passes were really nice. Um, he kept almost doing the Corey Evans job of picking up those loose balls and just making sure they were going to the right players at the right time. Um, I thought Jewison and Bennett, he looked really bright. And every time he's coming on recently, I'm going, oh, hang on a minute. He looks less deer in the headlights, sort of chicken no head. He's looking a little bit more like a potential Patrick Roberts kind of player where he's going to cut in, he's going to cause problems, he's asking questions, as opposed to just a kid that's going to run about and use his pace. Um but for me, one play that really made a massive difference, a huge, huge, huge difference. And I think if he was on any longer, he would have been a candidate for man of the match. But Lyndon Gooch, I thought, was absolutely outstanding today. Um, I think all of our good attack and play came from a lot of a lot of his work. But but Dave, I'll, I'll throw this one to you. Lyndon Gooch um, started the season well, dipped off a bit. He's had his injuries and we haven't seen him properly for a while. I think arguably you could say that He's a right back now for Sunderland, based on where he's played the majority of his games. But this season, the, uh, to this afternoon, so he was a little bit more attacking, which is maybe where he spent most of his Sunderland career. Um, he doesn't get spoken about as much when it comes to injured players. But how much can Lyndon Gooch add to this squad in the last sort of nine, ten games, Dave? Yeah, he um, he seems to have come back with a with a bit of a new lease of life. We always know that Lyndon will. Uh, with, with what he brings to the table, he's he's a he's an inherited um, he's inherited becoming a Macam. He, he's you know he's been here for that long. He's got the funny little weird accent, but he he's probably another he's probably another Lugo nine. He just embodies everything good about what we need in terms of attitude. He's one of the senior pros now. It's really hard to believe how long he's been playing football. Um, crazy. Um, we always know he gives us good energy. We always know he'll give us 110%. Uh, I've got a lot of time. In the last couple of cameos I've seen of him, um, I, I thought to myself, yeah, you, you've really got something to to bring to the table here. Um, yeah, I, I'm all for, what, because we're getting on at that point in the season where we're reflecting a bit and stuff, just more positives than negatives. I, I genuinely agree with Tony Mowbray the other week. I think we're two or three players away from being a very, very, very good side. Um, 
a couple of players uh, while the old foxes, I suppose, and and that's where it'll be interesting to see what the summer does, um, because it's not in our remit to sign players like that. But let's see, uh, let's see where we go. And uh, yeah, I think I think Lyndon Gooch and his his flexibility, his attitude. He he obviously looks after himself. You know, injuries are, are always going to be part and parcel, and he might be a little bit un unlucky. But um, yeah, I, I, more positive than anything. I think Gooch has been another one this year. To be honest, right? again, such a shame that we've had such a shit season with uh, with so many injuries, and and he's fallen victim of that, unfortunately. Yeah, you kind of you kind of almost forget about because Gucci's been here that long. You almost forget that he's still part of it, and he's he's missed for like the past, I think, six seven weeks. He's been out, but I think one thing we speak about a lot, me, you. Brad, Ross, people at the match, we are kind of a team for the kids. I mean, it's funny, I, I laughed before, Dave, when you said, I think maybe give the kids a try. I thought, well, you're looking at the under-12s at this point, but I get that you meant Benetti and, and Equa and whatnot. But um, but we have got a really, really young squad. Now, Lyndon Gooch, I was looking at it today. So he made his debut in David Moyes' first game. Sorry for mentioning the name, but um, that was a long time ago. It was Pep Guardiola's first game as Man City manager. Um, he's played 233, 234 games, I think, around in all competitions for Sunderland, and he's 27. So, Brad, I mean, when we're talking about experienced pros and, and needing that experience, a lot of the time we look at Danny Bart, a lot of the time we look at, like, O'Neill, we look at Pritchard, um, Stewart when he's fit and stuff like that. But I think Lyndon Gooch's experience and kind of, He's wily now because he's 27. You know, he's coming into his prime. I think Lennon Gooch could be massive towards the end of the season, um, not just for what he brings with his quality, which I think he has got a bit of quality. I think he's had a good season when he's played, but I also think he's experienced, Brad. I think I think Gucci could be absolutely massive no matter where we play him, couldn't he? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, we forget that he is what you would class as an experienced player now. Um, we still see him as a young up-and-coming lad, the same as... Uh, I think Man United fans used to look at Jesse Lingard. Um, but when he comes on, he knows when to draw a foul. If if something's not on, he'll draw a foul and he'll, he'll like relieve the pressure. Or he knows when to try and take that extra touch to get us on the front foot. He could be invaluable going forward. Now, if he is fit, you've got to remember, before the COVID season, before he became right back, in his first season in League One, I think he scored, he scored, 10 and got six assists, some of daft along them. And then just before COVID could tell it from seven or eight, Galhart's position is probably 10. And if you're going to pick one of them to to play as the lone striker, the probably is the same build. Could probably offer you just about the same, but Goose could offer you that bit more because he's got a bit of experience. I wouldn't be opposed to now seeing Lyndon Gooch either in the false nine or just having a go up front by himself. Um, but again, if we go to this back three bear in mind with the back three we did start the season with the three and for more of first two games we played with a back three um, granted we had strikers back then um, but I wouldn't be opposed to maybe seeing Gooch if we were playing to a front Gooch and Clark and just see how they get on because um, I think Gooch can offer us something going forward he isn't going to get back in at right back let's just put that out there now Trey Hume that's his shirt to lose and the only way to lose it is if he has two or three absolutely honking games or, God forbid, Touchwood gets an injury. Um, I, I, I would like to see Gooch in the more advanced positions now and put him back to where... Look, he, he, he's that, that's where he came through the academy as a striker or just off a striker. Why not give him a go there and add a bit of experience in that front line? Because, look, I know Roberts has got a few games behind him, but he's still not the most experienced pro. Jack Clark still learning his trade. Ahmad still learning his trade. Richard, yes, ex he got a bit of experience, but he's still coming back from an injury too. And he hasn't really been the Pritchard that we seen last year. I know it's been a step up in levels. I'd like to see Gooch there. And my only thinking is, is because he, he's, yes, he's played right back for the last two and a half, two and a half seasons, but he's also done about 10 years playing further forward. And that's a heck of a lot of experience that we could use to help them lads who are high up the park as well in the absence of Ross Stewart. But like Dave said, it's a free hit. Look, we are not going to get relegated. We're not even going to be sucked into it. 
we won't drop below 14th, I don't think. I, I can't see it unless it's absolutely stinking until, now, until the end of the season. And unless there's a miracle, the playoffs are gone. So it's now a matter of let's finish as high as we can, but let's also give these lads who are going to be here next year as much game time as that they need and let's try and change things. Today, the in-game management was, was excellent. There, there was a change in shape through the lads on. But now it's time to maybe think, right, this 4-2-3-1, what we have been playing, isn't quite working without an out-and-out striker. Let's do it from the start. Let's get our teams from the start. If it's not working, then we revert back to that and think, well, that, that's our bread and butter, really, and change it that way. That, that's in my opinion, anyway. You mentioned Gucci, and uh, to be honest, because of the striker situation, it's been a little bit of a... Should we choose someone this week? I think me and Dave spoke about Unai and had a laugh about that. Now on Gooch, we've, we've kind of gone around the merry go around a bit, but I'll I'll throw in my my horse into the the carousel to go around on. Um, Benetti, not by himself. I don't think he, he he could. I mean, he's he's quick. Yes, that, that's that's and he, he would he would make them them good runs. But the times when the ball needs to come up and it needs to stick to someone, he just hasn't got the physical presence. I know Galata at the minute, there is times when he does, the ball comes into him and he can hold on to it because he is a stocky man. Well, stocky boy. He, he is well built. Um, I don't think, if, if we were going to play Benetti up there, it's got to be with another striker. He can't do it on his own. I'm I'm, I'm 99% sure on that at the minute. Mm, I don't know. i quite like to see him. But I tell you, I'd really like to see Ross Stewart. Um, Dave, um, there's not many negatives today, to be honest. I know you could maybe look at Pato for the the goal, but I think it takes a deflection. And the, the save beforehand was just outstanding. And, and the week he's been called up in the 21s, I don't want to come on the podcast and criticise him for just one mistake. I'm a big fan of Pato, I think, as a whole, as a tripod or a quadruple when Ross is here. I think we're all we're all fans of Pat also, you know, maybe maybe he could have done better, but whatever. Um he saved us a lot more than he's cost us this season in my opinion. But I'm loath to have a go because I don't know how much of it's really his fault. But Dave, it's just it's just not happening, is it, for Joe Geltart. It's just not happening. He missed a sitter today and he he took two touches. That's something that was one touch. He just it's not working for him today. And I actually borderline feel sorry for him now. Um but it's not working, Dave, is it? Geldard hasn't worked. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's plain and obvious for everyone to see. Uh I think I think for Brad said it about Ellis Sims when he went back to Everton. Uh, they were they weren't thinking about Ellis Sims and his development. Um, and I think it would be a little bit foolish of Mowbray to keep persevering with Gelhart, if I'm quite honest. I think he should Did be right took today, out the Sims, he mind. Did it right today. Last minute equaliser yeah. against Chelsea. So Yeah, great, may, great finish may, as Maybe well. it was the right move for him. <laughs> <laughs> but if you listen, um, no, it's, it's not, your development's not at Everton, it's definitely at Sunderland. I know it might feel nice today, but just come back, please. <laughs> uh, and I, and I think Gelhard needs taking out the firing line for for himself, uh, not just for the team as well, but for himself. Uh, and I'd be very surprised if that doesn't happen eventually. If I'm quite honest, because it's uh, it, it it is a bit painful to watch. To be honest, um, he does little bits, but he is snatching at chances. He is making the wrong decision, and then I know that's why he's here. But yeah, it, he's been put into a shit situation. Um, and we're making the best of it, but ultimately, we've said a few times it's a free hit. Let's just let's just try some different things, see how we get on, and and see if he can maybe have a game towards the end of the season and and come back a bit refreshed and ready for himself for next year. You know, right? I'll, I'll try the same sort of question at you. I think it's probably been done to death, and I certainly don't want to end this on a negative because I feel positive about the performance today but um, look I, I kind of do feel a bit sorry for Geltard if I'm honest I think look his performances are not good the, the chances he's missed the Rotherham game the chance at Norwich I know he's fouled a little bit the chance today the, they're all whether you're a striker or not if you're an attacking player they should be going in the back of the net 
But I really doubt that a young kid came here expecting him to be our only striker and have all that pressure on him. He probably thought he was going to be playing with Roscoe for a couple of games and linking up with him, maybe coming off the bench and, and sort of learning his trade. Um, but he's got no one to bounce off, zero people to work f- like from. But I think today I felt really sorry for him and not because I thought he was unfairly taken off. It's just a bit painful to watch at the moment because it's just not working, Brad. Do we do we now take him out the firing line and just, you know, maybe... I know Gucci up front isn't perfect, Bennett isn't perfect, O9 up front or whoever you put up front, Diallo isn't perfect. None of it's going to be perfect, but we can't keep persevering with Geldart. It's just not working. No, I do agree. I, I really do feel sorry for the lad. And, and after the first few games in our little chat, you were even saying it's probably not going to work. And I, I was probably the one that kept persevering and said, no, he'll be fine. He'll come good. Look, it's... It's a, like you've said, it, it, it is utterly feeling sorry for him. And it's not him letting himself down. I honestly believe, and as much as the recruitment team has done well, I think the recruitment team have let him down. Because when he's come in, it was to play alongside Ross Stewart. And look, if he was playing alongside Ross Stewart, we could have been playing this 3 5 2. I have no doubt he'd have probably scored or assisted another couple of goals this season. Um, it's just unfair. He's a how old is he? 19, 18, 19, 20 year old kid come in. And at the time, it was a potential promotion push and expected to play nearly. Well, I know he's kept coming off, but with no other options, he was expected to play pretty much every minute or start every game as a lone striker in something that he's probably never done at any, any stage of his career. He's either been a wide, wide player like your Clarks or Roberts. Or he's always, he's always had another striker alongside him. Um, it probably is his time to maybe just give him a break, even just a game or two. Look, like we've said, it's just that this season now is to to finish as high as high as we possibly can. And I said last week before he was done the pod that I couldn't come on. If it gets to the last five or six games of the season and there was literally nothing to play for, it's maybe it's time to start not looking at these lone lads anymore. It's time to start putting, bedding the lads in for next season and look with an eye on next season. But again, that's, it's just poor management of how we've had to, we've brought him in and he's just been thrown, like in, he's been thrown the lines then. And it, it is so harsh on the lad because, like I've said, where he's played before, in that 10 roll or out wide, he looks good when he comes short. The thing is, he'll get the ball and knock it off and, but he's 10 yards behind the player then and we're bursting forward and there's literally no one in the middle. There was a time in the, set, the first half, Clark got out on the left-hand side, done his man once or twice. He went, to, looked up, went to put it in with his left and he had to cut back. Granted, you give it to Dan Neely with the post, but there was nobody in the box. Now, yes, I know he's a professional footballer. If he's told, like, you don't come back any further than that halfway line, he shouldn't be doing it. And I believe that's what Tony Moore will be saying to him, but it's just, he's so young, he's inexperienced, and I think he wants to impress. He wants to say, well, look, I'm not scoring goals. I, I, I want to try and help link this play up. He sees what Ahmad and, and Roberts can do together. And in the absence of Ahmad, he's tried to do what Ahmad does by going a bit closer to Roberts, but it's just not what he's there to do. And yeah, you, you, you have hit the nail on the head. It's it's but uh, feeling really sorry for the lad because he is a young lad. He's not like an experienced player an experienced lad in, in his late 20s who's just come here because he's fell out of favour somewhere. He's come here to try and get a bit of experience progressing in his career and if anything, it's probably he's done him a bit of a detriment coming here. Yeah, it has. It's it's harsh to say because I don't want to dig him out too much. No, I think, I think look... That's why... You know me, Graham. I'm I'm a big advocate of what the recruitment team have done, but for me, they they've they've well and truly messed that lad second half of the season up by not at least giving them some backup or an alternative where we can take him out and put someone else there. They've left us short, but they've also sold him short. I think a little bit. And look, the people listening to us saying, "Oh, he's rubbish." 
I kind of agree with you, if I'm honest. I think, but I think there's so many like mitigating circumstances, like where his age, where he's playing, how he's been asked to play, the pressure that's on his shoulders, how little actual football he's played. Yeah, you can't really excuse missing the chances he missed at like Rotherham and I mean they were the one to do was a sitter as well, but I can understand where where he is, where he's at. And th- we've seen a lot of players, I think, come through the door at Sunland and you can tell when they are crap. I'm not gonna dig anyone out and mention names. You know who's crap. Actually, I will, James Vaughan. You know when someone's crap. You can just tell from minute one. Whereas with Gelthart, you can see he's got summit. It's just like I don't know. I can't think of a good analogy here. It just isn't working. It hasn't worked for a number of reasons. He, and I think when you think about the firing line a bit. He will have a good career. I have no doubt about that. When he yeah. gets put in a team that play to his strengths. He will have a, he will have an excellent career, whether that's lower end Premier League or top end championship. He'll be one of them players that, that will go on, make a good living out of football, and some fans will love him. Because he has got something about him. His work rate is excellent. That's one thing I will not put him down for. He will not stop running. And it, 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 that is one thing that you can always say about him. He, he wears his heart on his sleeve. But playing with his back to goal as a nine is just not his game. And he'll look back at this probably as a big mistake in his career. When there was plenty of the championship clubs that were after him. Yeah. And we've probably sold him. Look, you're going to come and play with one of the best strikers in the league, play alongside him, feed him some goals. But unfortunately, he's had to take that take that on his own shoulders. And yeah, I, just, I don't really want to talk about him too much on the rest of the podcast no. because it's like it's like we're digging him out, but we're not. And you, you were perfect with the James Vaughan analogy, like I've just said. It's not like where we've took someone in whose career is maybe a bit stagnated. And he's utterly shite because James Warden was fucking atrocious. Gellhart is a good footballer. I have no doubt about it and he will learn. But it's just not going to happen at someone. Nah, it's just not. It's really not. But I think ultimately, like, today, obviously, the discussion about Gellhart had to be had. But I think probably people listening think, oh, it's been negative. But honestly, no, We, we I think we all feel positive about today. And we've now got, obviously, a week of uh, the international break where we can kind of Forget about it for a bit. It's gone a bit stale, I think, recently, because I think we kind of know we're not going to go down. But I think we kind of know we're definitely not going to go up as well. And that kind of leads to a season where you're basically, whether you want to be on the beach or not, you kind of feel like you're on the beach as a fan. You're kind of waiting for the next season and then what comes next year. But we'll we'll still be here, fortunately or unfortunately. I don't know. Um, and hopefully it'll continue to be as you know, relatively positive going into the end of the season um, and we'll get some good results and finish as high up the table as we possibly can because that's kind of thing all we can hope for at the moment but um, thanks as always um, for joining us on a, what appears to be a drama free season with eight games to go um, Dave thanks for joining me mate good to see you Absolute pleasures. Ple- oh, yeah. Pleasures. <laughs> <Maybe, laughs> yes. Maybe. maybe. And I've I've managed to go through a uh, I've managed to go through a whole podcast without saying me two favorite words. Apparently, so smashing it. <laughs> there was alluded, so- alluded. <laughs> What's that? The L word. <laughs> so oh, I thought it was going to be Ross and. <laughs> oh, that, we, all, we all know I love him. Um. For the listeners who want to know what the end joke was, there was a guy who really lovingly on Wednesday told me how much he enjoys the podcast, really super nice about it, um, which is always nice when people do that, of course, and I really appreciate it. Of course, we do. And then he went, oh, but there's a lot on your podcast that just, whenever he says something, he goes, listen. And I went, it's Dave. And he's like, I am listening. Stop saying it. <laughs> so I advised Dave to stop saying listen. So please don't say uh, listeners that we don't take your requests because <laughs> we certainly do um, if anyone wants to push Dave off the show completely let me know we can get it arranged <laughs> um, but lads thanks very much for joining me I know it's not the uh, the most riveting podcast I do after 1-1 draw but positive all the same good battling performance you can't ask for much more than that all the best mate yeah cheers gents bye <laughs>